Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. Welcome to Projections, our show about virtual reality and all the fun we're having. And this past week, well, we've been having a ton of fun. We've been buried in this game, Rec Room. Well, we've been buried in Rec Room <laughs> off and on for a period of time now. This is a free game, free for all. It is out for the Vive. It is out on Steam, on the Oculus Store, and on PSVR for free for anybody. It's been out for almost two years now. I know, and we've mentioned it as one of our favorite VR experiences of the last year, but it's been ever-changing, and we thought it'd be great to devote a full episode talking about our experiences in Rec Room because they've done something really interesting. Have they? Not only is it a metaverse of, of just playing you know, in, a, in a rec center, basketball, yes. squirt guns, um, taking selfies, whatever, mm -hmm. they have quests. Well, that's our favorite thing. That is my favorite thing. I believe it is the best thing about the Rec Room experience. Um, the, as you said, there are many other things to do, actually that maybe arguably have more replayability. Sure. You can go in and play paintball. You can play laser tag now. Disc golf. Disc golf was like the new World of Warcraft. <laughs> right? It was, we were hanging out in disc golf, just chatting away. Yeah. It was a new golfing for VR. This is a small team of people. This is 10 to 20 people. They're based in Seattle, and they keep releasing new and new, newer parts to this rec room experience. And it's almost like they have planted the seeds of what is a metaverse. There are hundreds of people in there at any given time, and uh, they're all playing basketball or they're chatting. Um, they have a great feature for how to deal with the younger audience, and that is if a, you are a junior account, you actually don't get your your microphone enabled, mm. which is, a, I think, a, a great touch. It's really interesting because it's not what you would consider a standard uh, MMO, um, RPG, or just a massive multiplayer game. Yeah. You know, while hundreds of people may be playing at the same time, or even thousands, we're all in these instances. So mm -hmm. you, know, you're, you and a dozen or so people are in one rec room, uh, which is this instance of it, this reality of it. And if you friend up with someone or party up, um, you guys can make sure you're in the same room. These guys think about VR deeply. So the way that you friend one another is doing a handshake. To party up, it's a fist bump. That's really nice animations. And you have your own avatars, of course. To access the menus, you look at your wristwatch and this VR HUD comes up. You touch every button physically with your finger. If you need to type something, a keyboard shows up and you hunt and peck with two of your fingers. Everything's very large and cartoonish, which yes. I think is suitable for VR because of the precision. You don't have finger precision mm -hmm. necessarily. So while you have your stubby hands, you know, your menu is massive and every button is pretty big. So the, the quests that we mentioned, they have evolved over time. Uh, initially, the first quest was kind of a mock fantasy quest and you would go through a school hall, essentially. They would, they, the theme was the halls of a school. This was the rec center. Apparently there's a school attached to it and you would adventure through them. There would be these cardboard enemies that would descend on ropes from the sky and roll towards you on their wheels. Um, but it was very much you were in a school. And very playful um, and lent itself to, well, you could call it low fidelity visuals, but I think it was very charming visuals. Oh yeah, no, I think from the beginning and still to this day, these guys know their limitations. Like, it, it looks like it's in a schoolhouse with a budget. It's yeah. a drama department sure. with a limited budget. Now this is exactly the same thing that we're dealing with in reality, where we have a VR team on a limited budget and they have designed to service that necessity. And I think that it really works visually uh, to, their, to, their, to their credit. Yeah, you're not jumping into these quests for a giant sprawling AAA dungeon, right? This is not Monster Hunter. Right. Uh, this looks like, you know, you're in, in a cartoonish school. And it speaks to this thing we learned early on in VR, which is the immersion factor of VR is not affected by the realistic fidelity of the graphics. You can be somewhere with a bunch of, you know, low poly objects in cartoony textures and it feels like you are in that reality. And something that we've also learned about VR is the power of social play, multiplayer play. So and much. that's what these quests really tap into. It's for the same reason that doing a quest with your World of Warcraft clan was so compelling. Mm -hmm. Doing a quest with three of your friends in a four player quest, which is sensibly just a, a very simple hack and slash game, mm -hmm. Uh, is extremely, extremely compelling. Yeah, so the rules from the quest since the first one were, you can die, if you die, a high five from a teammate will revive you. 
if all of your teammates die, it's game over. And there's no save points. So if you get far into the quest and everybody dies, it's starting over. And there's, you get nothing from that experience. You don't get to keep anything that you found. It's, uh, it's just the experience that you get to keep. That, that roguelike <laughs> experience, I think, yeah. making it intentionally difficult mm -hmm. um, by making it, uh, I, I think, is one of the most brilliant things they did. Well, let's talk about that in the context of this new quest. Okay. So initially we had a fantasy quest, then there was a science fiction 80s quest, they returned to fantasy, and now the new one is pirate themed. Yep, it's called Isle, Isle of the uh, Lost, Lost Skulls. Skulls. And uh, to be honest, we haven't beat it yet. That's how difficult it is. Not for lack <laughs> of trying. Every night for two hours. Yeah, so this one is a three-player quest, and all the rules, like you said, apply. One hit kills. Yeah. Uh, the enemies, uh, unlike the Jumbotron quest, the, the, the 80s theme mm -hmm. quest, you start off with just melee weapons, and it's very simple parry and hack and slash. Yeah, one hit kills on us. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it actually takes two kills to kill the bad guys yep. uh, if you have a sword. But there's some interesting new strategies to this. And part of the fun of this quest was learning these strategies. Because you go in blind, they don't give you a tutorial. And it turns out that you want to do things like a, you have a sword or a broom. The bad guy comes at you with a sword. You don't want to start hitting at him because he'll defend himself almost, you know, infinitely. You want to let him try to hit you and defend it, at which point he will go back and that's when you attack. Mm -hmm. So that took us a few tries to actually learn that strategy. Yeah. There's also bad guys who throw bottles at you. Sometimes they're just glass bottles, sometimes they're explosive bottles, but it turns out you can catch those in midair. And learning that kind of strategy when you discover it is ex extremely exciting. And I know if you haven't played a lot of VR, these strategies, this type of game mechanic, sounds really elementary, simple, <laughs> yeah, right? Like, you know, this is stuff that you've seen in every single third person or first person action game, you know, since the PS1 yeah. or old computer games. But the reason it's so compelling in VR is because you're not just tapping a button to swing a sword, you are physically swinging the sword. You're not just positioning your cursor to click and, and, and catch a bottle as it's thrown at you, you are actually physically reaching your hand out mm -hmm. and catching a bottle. The dexterity that's required is, in, is immersive. And I like that they kept it simple because it lets you focus on your hand dexterity, on your positioning, um, and not, have, not be overwhelmed. Right. Now you mentioned a three-person quest. Mm -hmm. uh, that, this is the first quest that is strictly three people. The other ones, I think, optionally, you yep. could do three people, but it allowed for four. Now, why do you think they went for three this time? I think because it means that uh, as, as the team progresses through the map, if you are split up, you are more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. If you're playing, the more you know, having four people or five people potentially uh, means that you're never going to feel really at risk because if one person gets injured, you know, other people can go rescue them. But here, if you have three and one person's left alone, you have to make a decision of your positioning in the map and where you are relative to your team. Whether you all stick together and be vulnerable to take a big attack or whether you're going to split up and attack from different directions. So it's a difficulty scale. Yeah. yeah. So they lowered the max number of people in order to make it a harder quest. I think so. And it is a harder quest. Yeah. By all accounts, it is by far their hardest feature that they've made yet in this yeah. game. Um, we've tried several nights and you know, we're not the best in the mm -hmm. world, but we have we are experienced gamers. I feel that we have a lot of experience in VR, and yet we've gotten far but not to the end, and it's been excruciating. <laughs> I, I would dare say that there's one mechanic in this game that may be my favorite decision for a a, um, a, a pistol mechanic oh, yes. in any VR game. Now, we've played a lot of VR shooters, right? Mm -hmm. Robo Recall, unlimited ammo, or instant reloads, and really satisfying to, to blast robots and throw away your guns. Right. Uh, here, there is a pistol, but the pistol has two shots maximum, and you have to physically reload by... Which means you have to have a free hand. A free hand to, to manually cock the, the trigger at a hammer to reload it. That I love. The limited ammo, the fact that it is two shots after which the gun becomes absolutely useless because yep. you don't pick up ammo, mm -hmm. um, means that your shots have to count. And yeah. you are aiming down that, those sights and you're hoping to God that you hit that other guy because the, the guy that you're trying to hit also has a gun with bullets that fly just as fast. It, it felt like dueling, like swashbuckling dueling like you would see in a Western or in a pirate film, right? Yeah. You're like Jack Sparrow holding two of these pistols. I've already cocked both of them. Right. And then shoot one, 
drop the gun, shoot the other, reload, pick up the other gun, reload, and shoot again. Oh no, I'm out of ammo, look for the other gun. And you're backtracking looking for guns. And by the, now, they all have seen you, so they're trying to shoot at you while you're backtracking. Um, I, w I would play a full game with just that mechanic. You don't even get to these guns until probably 20 minutes into the game. Yeah. So they, they reveal these more, uh, you know, intricate or harder weapons, uh, more powerful weapons deeper into the game. Um, and, and that is a good part of the game design by far. Uh, there's also new enemies that show up as you progress through the game. And I would say that this um, pirate themed quest has the biggest budget of any of their quests so far. Sure. It's, while it is still set in a school, and yeah. you can look at the rafters and you can say, I'm in a gym right now, they have laid dirt and palm trees, and I feel much more immersed in the fantasy world in this game than I have in any of their previous mm -hmm. quests. Mm -hmm. Now, something we want to talk about, I thought was interesting, is that these, these are one time through. Like, like you said, there are no checkpoints. Right. All right why, why do you think that was? And you think that was the right decision for this type of game? There is a, such a payoff to getting to a point that you have not gotten to yet yeah. have, after numerous times of trying. Like sure. You want to master that part and you want to break through that wall. And when you do, boy, is there a payoff. Yeah. And it's, it just feels great. Right. We, we spent three nights getting through one choke point yeah. and not being able to pass. And then the night that we did pass, it felt like we were getting a whole new game. It's elating, especially because this game does reveal new things. You go outside, you're on top of a ship, and mm -hmm. you're firing a cannon, and there's all this new stuff that you can do. So it is exciting, and it does have a, a nice design to it. They, they thought through the progression of this game way beyond the last quests. But that also means that if some people might get frustrated and never finish the game. I think that probably the majority of people will not see the entirety of this content. Yeah. And th that's an interesting decision for them to make. This is mm -hmm. a small team. Right. I'm not sure that it's a foregone conclusion that they can afford to make content that not everybody can enjoy. Because it's intentionally difficult. Exactly. Right, so it's a trade-off between having something that's very rewarding mm -hmm. or something that, or, or uh, this quantity of content right. that you get as a player. I, I do question, and I, and I would love to interview these guys at some point. And if this was their, their boardroom decision to make a game that is intentionally extremely difficult that not everybody will finish, yeah. more power to them. But it, it is possible that it is so hard for lack of testing. I mean, mm -hmm. perhaps these guys are so good at their own game that they thought it was difficult but not unfinishable. Right. Now, I mean, it's, it's something that you would apply not just to VR games, too. Absolutely. Right? And, and, you know, you talk about, um, like, uh, like it's very, very difficult, you know, Japanese RPGs yeah. or something, right? You, you got to play through it. Right. You got to actually, you know, it's very, very difficult. But once you get to that point where mm -hmm. you learn all the mechanics and through endurance, it's very rewarding. And this is rewarding. And there's a lot of people out there that would that love this idea of a game that isn't for everybody. Not everyone's gonna see the red levels in, Temp in Tempest. Not everyone's gonna fit, get a perfect game of Pac-Man and see that kill screen, right? Mm -hmm. This is hard to do, and yeah. you are special if you can do it. But I also think this is content that they spent a lot of money to develop, and I wanna see it. And if we keep coming back to it, to playing two hours at a time and still can't break through that wall, maybe there should be a mode where we, maybe we don't get the great loot. Maybe we don't get the unlockable or the achievement by doing it in one run, mm -hmm. but maybe we can start from a later chapter, at mm -hmm. least as a practice run. I also think that because they're releasing these quests on a semi-regular basis, it almost mm -hmm. feels like episodic in some sense. Yeah, every few months it seems yeah, like. Yeah, the, the time it takes to finish a quest, and if, if you're frustrated, you could take a couple of weeks off, that, will, that pacing will, will get you the, the, back in the game regularly. Because mm -hmm. they made it easy and I finish a quest on easy mode, I might not necessarily want to come back and get that achievement and finish on hard mode. Yeah. And I'm waiting a couple months for the next quest. Like now, we're actually playing weeks at a time trying to beat this. And when we fail, we're at the point now where Norm is in a fetal position yep. on the ground. And you can see his controllers and his head <laughs> on the ground curled up. I am banging my head against the wall. I have not played a game in so long like this where it actually puts my friendships in a little bit of jeopardy. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the, pretty much the highest recommendation we can give. Um, really interesting, the fact that they are slowly building up this metaverse, one lobby, one rec room yeah. environment at a time. Uh, I think it's, it's unreasonable for us to expect for a metaverse just to happen instantaneously. Right. You know, for Facebook or, or Google to make a VR environment that's gonna be the place, the one destination. 
um, do it something simple. You know, set expectations right, and I think Rec Room has done that, and they've made it a free game. I mean, what, what do you think their business model is going to be going forward? I mean, probably hats. You know, it's probably going to go that Team Fortress 2 route where it's, mm -hmm. there's going to get, be enough people involved in the community that um, they can just sell the accoutrements. Or yeah. they have this amazing section we should probably devote another show to called Custom Rooms and Circuits where you could essentially build your own quests. Oh. You can con uh, connect rooms to one another so it can be endless, and you can create all kinds of logic in an oh my god kind of jaw-dropping degree. I mean, not quite Minecraft, but heading that direction. The amount of drawing of circuits and creating different you know, pieces of logic to have um, actions, have effects throughout the world. Um, that's a fascinating side of this game that they have only unleashed this year. Yeah. So um, there's going to be a lot more coming from these guys. I hope to get them on the show, find out more about their design process, and, and really learn about what they've learned from VR. Because I think they're forging a lot of really interesting new ground. And until we can do that, we encourage you to check it out and let us know how far you get in those quests. <laughs> Here they come. Oh, no. No, no, no. Oh, God. Friendly fire. Oh shit, I'm down! No! 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 So Norm, you just got back from Las Vegas. Yes. Where you had an interesting VR experience of your own. What, yeah. what did you do there? Yeah, uh, there's an experience in Las Vegas um, called Zero Latency. Zero Latency is actually a company that has these location-based VR franchises mm -hmm. all across the world. A bunch in the United States, they have some in Australia, um, in Europe. And this is the first one that I've done in what's essentially a mall environment. It's at the MGM Grand. It's a part of their, their level up bar thing. But um, if you pay 50 bucks. 50 bucks. 50 bucks per person, okay. up to eight people, and they have three games to play. One's a zombie shooter, one's a puzzle game, mm -hmm. um, and one is a space alien shooter. Or How long is the shooter. How long? And it's 30 minutes. And for that one game? For the one game. Okay. For 50 bucks, which, yeah, I know it sounds like a lot of money, but if you're in Vegas, you know, that's, that's just two hands of poker or something, right? right? Um, but I had a ton of fun. So when I think of location-based experience, I immediately think of the void, which is something I still have yet to try. But the idea is it's a room scale where yes. I can walk around a space and there are objects potentially in the space that I can avoid that exist in the real world but look like a piece of plywood. In the right. VR space, they might be something else. Is right. that what we're talking about That's here? not what we're talking about. So both the Void and Nomadic, the right. people we uh, interview, they've set up location-based VR experiences where there are other objects mirrored in the world. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a table or a wall or even elements like wind or smells or heat, right. like they put that in the, world, in the virtual world and the real world because they control both those spaces. Here, it's think of it more like a holodeck. Uh, the space was, they said 2,000 square feet, so was, to me it felt more like 30 feet by 65 feet, definitely mm -hmm. more than twice as long as it was wide. And with eight people, we're not running around the whole time by any means. Um, you are wearing a, a backpack, weighs about 20 pounds uh, all told, uh, with a computer, wearing OSVR goggles and their own tracking solution. But you're basically, it's basically wave-based shooters. Um, you stand in one spot with position yourself in the virtual room mm -hmm. alongside your seven other players. The waves of enemies come toward you, and when you defeat those waves, a path opens up and you move to the other side of the room. So that's when you move? That's when you walk. Are you behind any kind of cover for the portion that yes. you're shooting? So they have cover, there are walls, they do the thing where you can look off into the distance with ledges. So, uh -huh. you know, they make the space, the virtual space, feel a lot bigger ah, right, than, sure, of course. than the actual physical space. So while you are taking cover, that cover doesn't exist in the doesn't real world. It actually exists. But it gotcha. doesn't matter, you know, as we know, playing right. VR at home. Sure. And you're actually holding a physical track controller as well, a space rifle, uh, with a reload button on the bottom and a cocking mechanism. Uh, oh, that's so cool. it's actually, you know, it's it's like having a uh, HTC Vive tracker on an accessory, except everyone has that accessory. And you can see all other seven people? Yes, there is uh, inverse kinematics, so you see a physical avatar. What okay. I thought was interesting was that, you know, as we know, playing VR at home, you have to calibrate your height yeah. or your handedness, and all that's done in the lobby, in the physical lobby. You type in your name and your, your, uh, your stats. When you jump in the game, the way they associate your backpack and your your control unit with mm -hmm. the character you've created is you walk into this cylinder with your name floating above it. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and then that's how they, they get everyone to start the game and load the game at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then what I thought was interesting was they also split people up. So we had a group of eight people. You're all on the same team? All on the same team, okay. but they physically split you up because uh -huh. they have one team maybe move off to the right side of the room because that's where one path goes. Right. And the other four people move to the left side of the room and it looks like a separate diverging path. And then there's a wall separating us, so you're in a smaller space. So you can't see them? So you can't in VR. see them right. in VR. That's interesting. And then that space might be on a conveyor belt that's moving. No, wait, in real life? In, no, 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 in, in VR as well. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a moving platform. Right. And then you see your other team in the distance. Oh, wow. But the distance is actually further than where you are right. physically yeah. because you see some animation. Huh. Of, um, of your platform moving. Oh, interesting. So, so they do these tricks. They mess with the one-to-one. -one. They totally mess with the one-to-one. -one. And of course, you're not really physically interacting. You're not like throwing things to the person on the other side. Yep. So it doesn't matter how far they actually are. Yeah. But then by the end of that conveyor belt, you're then joined back. Oh, that's and then you're then within that 30 feet from them. What about audio? Can you hear your you can. comrades? You get headphones, you have microphones, ah. you have voice comms. And okay. that's really the, the most uh, social part of it because you're hearing people laughing and, and freaking out and shooting. Yeah. And people are there you know, with various degrees of experience of VR, right? Like not everyone there has an Oculus or has a HTC Vive. So they yeah. had to develop an experience that was going to be comfortable for you know, 14 year olds, in the first time in VR, and, and it works. You're carrying around a computer for a half an hour. It, it is and physically exhausting. Is this a heavy thing, the weapon? It's, it, it's not as heavy as a, like a real no, gun, right. but yeah. It's, it's not a piece of cardboard. It's not a piece of cardboard. Wow. And I, I felt it the next day. <laughs> really? I totally felt it. Was all that from all the physical movement? Yes, of bracing myself. For a half an hour, yeah. yeah. And even gripping, yep, gripping the trigger, yeah, totally. So, totally worth it. Oh, one, one other interesting thing you did, uh, with the VR spaces, there's one part of the level, and I'm sure we can't show any footage from that because uh -huh. we couldn't capture it, but they had us progress and the gravity changed from the map. So imagine like this is the horizontal platform, yep. and I'm walking along, and then it looks like the, gra the, the, the map um, angles up, uh -huh. and as I walk, the gravity boots lock you into the spot. So you're yeah. technically only still walking on a flat, flat surface, yeah. But the game, it looks like... Was that convincing? It was totally convincing. No kidding. And it was funny because one person would walk out onto the platform, and for them, they would see the world <laughs> shift. But they'd turn around, everyone would be on their side. <laughs> like, how are you doing that? Yeah. That's pretty cool. I think that was a neat way for them to make use of um, you know, slight changes yeah. in, in elevation. You know, the, fa the fact that it was convincing is the more interesting part to me because it, yeah. this whole idea of redirective walking, mm -hmm. which is where they have you slightly turning in real life, but yeah. in, in the VR space that would look like you're still going forward. Um, that's, that's something I've always wondered, is that going to be convincing to everybody? Like, is everyone going to be mentally fooled by that? And it seems like maybe that's easier to do than I thought. This is a... It's, I guess it's a redirected elevation. Yeah. I guess I would call it that way. Uh, there was one part of it where the redirected, there was a, a virtual ramp, and that wasn't convincing at all because it was weird. We were walking and we expected to be falling, like going down an incline, right. um, but we weren't. And so that wasn't convincing. But when you see the world on, at a slight angle shift, that one to me felt really convincing. And what are the other two? Uh, the other two is a zombie shooter, mm -hmm. uh, which I think I assume is a, a similar experience, and one is a, a puzzle-based game, which is more like an escape room um, that was intended for younger audiences. Did you make the right choice? Um, I don't know. I, I'm You're curious about the, the zombie one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, definitely it was one of those things. I think Vegas is a perfect location for mm -hmm. it. People are there looking to spend money to waste an hour, waste half an hour. Uh, we heard people leave this center saying they wanted to come back and huh? sign up immediately. So. Uh, you know, they, they, they were pretty full. Good for them. I mean, yeah. it, it's, this is going to be a year a lot of people try VR for the first time yeah. yet again, just yeah. like last year. But now there's gonna be, they're going to be on the shelf. The prices are a lot more reasonable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to be a big year for uh, new adopters. Yeah, both, both this type of experience and even things like The Void, which is in New York, in yep. Times Square, in Disneyland, uh, in downtown Disney. Uh, the Star Wars experience. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. For so many people, it is going to be their first time. And I think a lot of people are curious and maybe they want to spend $300 right now on a headset. So much better that this be their first experience yes. than something like cardboard. They, right. I, I want something that's even better than what you can get at home to be yeah. their first experience. That's great. Yeah, so I'd love to hear more recommendations from people who have done these type of location-based VR experience, whether it's a local mall or a theater or a popular tourist location, and give us recommendations because we'd love to check them out and see, see how they're implemented.
Uh, that does it for this week's episode of Projections. Next week is GDC, the mm -hmm. Game Developers Conference, and coincidentally, the one-year anniversary of when we started this show. And uh, we'll be back <laughs> with a lot, hopefully more, some game demos and more interviews yeah. and a lot of stuff from the show. Yeah, we certainly have some things scheduled, and it's going to be uh, hopefully the best, biggest year yet at GDC for VR. And Until then, we're going to go back in Rec Room and try to beat that quest. <laughs> we'll see you then.